We are live here in Cozumel. We thought we would uh, show you the cave exploration group that Gus and I were invited to join. It's a pretty big honor. Um, this was certainly our first time ever doing any cave exploration. I've never even been invited to do it before. So we have Mike Young. Hello. We have <laughs> Randall. Hi. And we have another Mike. Hello. So we're all, I'm going to do the best I can here. We're all at a table sort of huddled up and um, full of energy, full of energy. We just had a full, full day. I mean, you know, well, what did we do the past three days? Why don't you just tell them a little bit about what's been going on? Let's just start with that. So the director of ecology for the island has projects that he's working on and uh, he needed water samples, he needs maps made, uh, things like that, uh, so that they can protect the underwater systems they have here on the island. Yeah, so basically this is really the real deal, everybody. Like we are in areas of the cave that nobody has ever been in. Um, Gus in particular, along with Randall, like how many feet of line did you guys lay? At least 1,500. I, yeah, at least for sure. It was it was a lot. It was a lot. I mean, they they, yeah. they really did. I my first couple of days were with this mic, and we found some cool side passages. We found some leads, and and Woody found out why it's called exploring because most of the time <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, that's it, a good point. We're, we're in a cave that's kind of dark, and it eats light, so it looks like it looks like it's going, and then you go a little ways, and it's a wall. But that's. That's part of the fun. You never know what's going to be around the corner. And and you have to understand that you will absolutely experience silt outs. You, it's just part of it. You're going oh, to, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. you know, Gus went down, he could tell you himself, but one tunnel where you're giving that well, back out of. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the, the bacteria that has been growing there for decades doesn't really help because even if you look at it wrong, it's just pff, complete zero visibility in a lot of these passages. So... Um, yeah, there were a couple of little tunnels that as soon as you go through, I mean, you, you did too, uh, visibility goes to zero. <laughs> Instantly. And you know, one thing I do want to say about it is, like, it's a real skill, okay? They're, these guys know how to do it. Mike has, I'm just going to say this, I think he has some superpower instinct because I'm looking at one part of the cave and I'll hear, eh, 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 go that way, go that way. I'm like, well... It's just as black his way as my way, but his way, the cave keeps going. My way, it then ends into a little tiny nothing. And it's just unbelievable. It is an instinct. It is a skill. It really is. And there's a lot of logistics and a lot of things that you have to do. So we're not just out there randomly cave exploring and not, right? We, we Gus and I are with experts. I just want everybody to know that. But I think it's really cool because, um, you're allowing us to do this with you. Yeah. And, and that's just something that is we, I, well, unique. It, it shouldn't be, but it is. You know, I didn't, I, I, I had a couple of guys that mentored me whenever I started cave diving. Uh, and so for me and, uh, and, and some of my friends, we, we really felt that it was important for us to give back. And so every time we put a trip together, we invite a few people along that we can mentor and help them have a taste of this and become better at it. So, and it, and it really is highly addictive. I mean, Randall, we we, I, you, we and you've been talking a lot about this. It's oh, yeah. like you you see a lead, right, and you find one, and you're going, you're going, and I don't want to come. We don't want to stop. I know you were the same, Gus. You're like, I don't want to get out. Mike had to say to me, uh, 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 uh. Yeah. it's highly addictive. I actually had to tell you three times. I know. I just couldn't off. help it. I couldn't help it. And here's the other thing I noticed. I, I really, it's dangerous. I did lose track of time. You lose track of time because you're doing so much and you're tasked that all of a sudden you're like, time has gone by and you have a planned time. I yeah. made a planned time. You, you have to hit the plan. You, you really do. So, all right, so we're getting some questions here. Thank you so much. I'm monitoring the question on the computer because it's easier. Okay. Um, first question is, Mike, have you dived in Brazil? I have not yet. Oh. I would love to dive in Brazil. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah. People are inviting us to Brazil. Well, let's make a plan. 
How do you simulate loss line procedures in silt out conditions? Let's let someone else answer that. Simulated? Do you, yes. do you teach so as you're training the game game diver, how do you simulate loss line notice? Yeah, uh, so a mask. Yeah, a lot of times they put a you mask on. You just put a black mask on. Yeah, yeah your, your cave instructor will put a mask on you and drag you off the line and you have to find the line with, by deploying a safety reel. And yeah, they usually pick a pretty, pretty stable part of the cave that you're not going to tear up. And then but that way the instructor can still see yeah. and, right. he can, and keep Helps. you safe. Uh, of course. Okay, this is a good question for Mark. Are there any caves worth diving in Cozumel with just your open water advance? No. no. All of the caves no. in Cozumel are advanced caves. And now over on the mainland, they have some that are, they're, they're more recreational. Yeah. Not on Cozumel. The caves here are all advanced level. I mean, not, not even for your basic cave diver. It's advanced. I, I would, no way would I be in these without no. these guys. I could tell you that. Can you ask Mike about the super winder? What is this? Oh, the Rumors? new, is that the new side winder? Do you, do you have any comments on that? We, we... Well, I mean, uh, Patrick has been showing it at the boat show. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's gonna be great. There's, there's a lot of new features uh, to it. And so. This is a really good question for Mike or for anyone who wants to answer. How do you plan for a dive where you've never been before? That's a cool question. <laughs> that, that is That's very difficult, question. but That's mainly, a great question. mainly you have to go on run time, okay? And that run time has to vary, okay? If you're, if you're going like 30 feet deep, then you can, play, you can plan on, you know, like an hour and a half run time because your bailout will be enough to get you out. But you start getting 60 feet deep, you say, okay, an hour is too long now because now you're gonna have decompression and your gas will go faster if you have an emergency. And so you have to back that number back. And so you have to kind of have an idea in your head and, and, and adjust it on the fly. Awesome, okay. Uh, a lot of questions are whether we're using the Sidewinder number two. None of us are using the new no. model yet. I, I don't think not it's yet. available even no, for anybody not, to it's use. Not, it's not out of testing yet. I mean, they, they've just <clears throat> tested some, mm -hmm. but it's not available to as a prototype to dive yet. Yeah. Uh, we can go around the room for this one. Is there any place where you don't want to dive again? All right, let's start. We're gonna done a dive. You don't want to go back anywhere. Yeah, well, I anywhere, was... Mike. Oh. Can't really think of any off the top of my head. <laughs> now, remember, these are hardcore cave explorers. So <laughs> it's gonna be yeah, hard. I'll, I'll dive just about anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so far. Well, I've been buried alive a few times, and I don't want to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't done that. No. Yeah, I had to, I had to dig my way out, and uh, so no, I wasn't. Uh, Drop the line and bury the line. You guys, yeah, they, they did ask I, me I to survey that cave, line. and so I surveyed up to that rock slide that buried me, and that was as far as I went. You got any that you would never want to go back to? It's an uh, interesting question. Yeah, that, that is a good question. No, I don't think so. I mean, there are some dives that are like one and done. Like, I don't need to do Silfra again in Iceland. Like, it was cool, but I don't need to do it again. Yeah. But it's not that, like if I had the opportunity to do it, like for free, somebody says, hey, you want to go to Silfra and I'll pay for it? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's no dive that I wouldn't do again. I remember after I took a, of all people, I took an ice diving class with Doug Ebersol, me, right? From Fort Lauderdale. And, and Doug was your instructor? No, no, Doug was, oh, okay. Doug took it with no. me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. No, no, no. That's impressive. The Thorntons were our instructors and they were awesome out in Utah. And I remember afterwards, it's so exhausting, cutting the ice, getting all the gear out to the ice, and all of that. I don't know if I yeah, can do I'm that again. Yeah, I'm not doing that again either. Okay, so that may um, be this, this is a really good question. I'm doing question. a class next weekend if you guys want to. I, yeah, yeah, we're not doing that again. Not Are you sure? Sure? <laughs> this is a really good question. How perfect, I guess how good, does your buoyancy or trim need to be before you start cave training? It's gotta be pretty spot on. Yeah, I mean, your buoyancy and your trim have to be pretty spot on. Any good cave instructor is going to improve on whatever you come to them with. Um, but yeah, you need to have pretty good control of buoyancy. You can't be all over the place. Yeah, no. No. Yeah, you can't be up and down. Like I'd say if you're within like a three or four foot window on buoyancy, you're probably pretty decent to maybe start cavern. And, and they really may not know why. I mean, some people on this may not know why. Listen, it silts out even looking at it wrong, right? And, and a, go, a, go good, a, a good litmus test is, it, is a, some of these buoyancy classes will have like these hula hoops that they set up at different mm -hmm. levels and you yeah. have to be able to go through the hoop without touching it. And you know, if you can't keep your buoyancy enough, 
or your trim well enough to go through and then shift levels and go through another one, then you need to keep practicing. And, and for me, the hardest thing was learning the different kicks because it, and certainly in South Florida, you're just flutter kicking. Yeah. It's all drift diving, right? So it's like, I, you got to You got to learn frog you mean kicking. There's another kick besides frog. <laughs> you see, I mean, <laughs> you got to frog kick. You got to do helicopter turns. You got to do reverse frog kicks. And you got to be able to keep this buoyancy while doing work, while doing line work. That's hard. It's hard. It, it takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, a lot of questions about starting cave training is how much experience would you, which, or which classes would you recommend before starting cave training? Anybody? Just a lot of diving. Probably like side mount class, class or intro to tech class. Yeah, I'd say intro to tech. Yeah, intro yeah. to tech or yeah. side mount, yeah. And what if, yeah, I mean, they could go in cabin, they're going to get yeah. a lot of that experience. Yeah. So. But if they, if, they, if they start their cavern class after they've done a tech side mount class or an intro to tech class, they'll, they'll have a whole lot better foundation on their buoyancy and propulsion in that before and going into the cavern class, they'll get more out of it. You teach those, right, right? Yeah. Yeah, by the way. A really What's good the instructor. What's has done? Deepest dive you've done. 472 feet. <laughs> we all these guys were with these guys. And Randall was right beside we me. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I was safety diving. Very Mine cool. kept us safe. Yeah. Very awesome. You didn't dip your computer to go like one extra foot than my. Can you say where it where was? Where it was? <laughs> Can you say no, where No, actually, I turned it before he could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was on his way down. I'm like, turn around. I was trying, I was trying to get Don't the shot from down low. Don't and I explained it. And they did, they did that at uh, Roaring River. Everybody. Yeah. The, yeah the deepest cave in the United States now. Cool. Did you all find anything that wouldn't see in the open ocean in the cave? Silt. Lots of silt. <laughs> Lots of silt. Lots of silt. I mean, the formations themselves. Yeah, yeah the formations. Yeah. You know? Formations that we saw. Uh, a mattress, a roller skate, a shoe, <laughs> a boot, yeah. a bunch of bottles. A dry cave. We, we found a 1970-some day oh, did anyone, dive light. Yes. Did yeah. anyone look at their depth gauge in the dry cave to see if it was below? No. So I did. I can check my nerd, though. No. It had to be. Oh, it, 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 it zeroed my, so it must have been. Yeah. It must have been. Oh, at, okay. at, By the way, if so everybody knows, we did come up in, like, a park today. Like, these, these cenotes yeah. can come up, like, in a park or right in the back of a church. Some, might, I think, are even, like, starting inside of a mall. You told me yeah, like one yeah. starts inside the mall, everybody. That's where it starts. You could go shopping and then go back to Sonate. <laughs> That's wild. Uh, what is your guys' most memorable moment in a cave? Wow, that is such a question. Hmm. I mean, I feel like seeing Virgin Cave is up there as, yeah. as my most memorable, but, you know, is rivaled by seeing the Glass Factory for the first time. Glass Factory is yeah. just... I, and for me, I, I, I haven't been to the glass factory, but Fanghorn Forest, just because that was my graduation dive, so I was allowed, even allowed to go on my very last dive. However, today is never going to leave my mind. Mike, uh, let me run the reel, and we found, he, he's got it surveyed, and he's called it yeah. Woody's Line. I mean, I actually Woody's have my line. own line in there. So 254 feet of line so nice. i mean how can and i he not, laid it perfect, perfect not ever tie-offs. we're gonna have about eight of gus's circuits <laughs> 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 gus and i ran a lot of circuits today yeah so. well that's one thing about the cozumel caves is there are a lot of circuits i mean this they they, they go every direction yeah and so you know and the circuit by the way just means like they'll end up circling back that's just something that happens yeah. Does Mike get nervous when going through a tight restriction for the first time in a new game? It doesn't seem like it. No, to me. not really. <laughs> it's it's you you it, there, there's a lot of planning involved. It's not you know, and so you sit there and think, okay, what could go wrong? Can I handle that? No, you, you know, if if you've already had a couple things go wrong on that day, you're gonna be like, eh, this might be the the third one so yeah. you know it, but if you've been having a great day everything's been running smooth you know and it, it, it looks you know mostly doable but you gotta you gotta remember that on a rebreather you have hours to solve a problem and so even if you get stuck it's like you have hours to get out yeah so it's not a nervous thing no did you get nervous when you went through the time restriction in the cave today yeah, so, so that's, that's why I didn't want to answer for you, but I, I was going to say, I didn't get nervous today going through that restriction. 
I assume it doesn't even raise your heartbeat <laughs> <laughs> even a second because I didn't I didn't have a problem, so that was good. There is there is though this it, it's it's kind of weird. There is almost a, though a sense. This is going to sound crazy, which coming from me can be normal. I, I actually find it to be a sense of calmness rather than anything else because you can't really see anything, but you know you're safe. You have a line. It's almost like more reassuring to me than if I was just lost out in the open ocean because I have the line. I have oh, yeah, my rebreather. I'm more nervous when I'm lost in the ocean. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I have, we have a line, we have our rebreather, we have, we're controlling our partial pressure. Yeah, you can't see, but you just know is all I gotta do is follow the line back out. And you know, on a tight restriction, I found out today by accident, a benefit of being on a restriction is if you drop your reel, it won't go far. <laughs> <laughs> I was squeezing through it, it's like, oh. <laughs> just kept going. So that worked out. Um, okay, so this is, a, this is a good question. Um, where is it? If you're deep enough in a cave where decompression is required and you hit an air bucket, are you still under decompression effects? Yes. You're still under pressure. Yep. There you go. Same same idea as a habitat. You know, it's, yeah, it's we're actually so creating air pockets. All right. Have any of you guys had a cave rescue training? No, I have not. It is there no. even? I mean, I'm gonna ask a question. Is there formal like cave rescue classes? There, there there's groups that do that do training, but I don't think there's any agencies that have like formal training that I know of. Okay. There's a uh, IUCRR used to have training, no? There, there are some, <coughs> there are some trainings available, and there, and there's a group formed recently to do sump rescues, and they're and they're practicing training, you know, in a sump cave so that they could uh, extricate a person who was injured or something in the dry cave and bring yeah. them through. Um, yeah. Um, what goes in your mind when you basically have to dig yourself back out, like in the Blue Spring dive? Well, you've got to not panic <laughs> and uh, and just get to work, get started, get it done. <laughs> exactly. And you were an open circuit. Now, the first step's the important one, something like that, right? The first, yeah. the first step, just don't freeze, just do something and hopefully it's the right direction. Thank you, uh, One Arm Wolf, for the super chat. By the way, every super chat, I'm really appreciative. Every time somebody does a super chat, we're trying to build like a super awesome scuba tech scuba van. So every dollar that we get really helps us because we still want to go on trips and record content for you guys. But we realized that building a van costs a lot more than we thought. <laughs> sure so, does. Thank you for the super chats. Um, let's see. So several questions about who's your guy's favorite buddy to dive with? <laughs> the, reason, the, reason, the reason why I'm, I'm pausing on this, and, and really, I'm gonna tell you this, is like, I don't know, I like to live in the moment of diving. I've said this a hundred yeah. times on Dive Talk. I really do, because I don't want somebody to think, well, maybe I'm not enjoying this dive with them because for them, it could be like the most amazing dive they've ever had. Not just to say you're not my favorite buddy, but even favorite places. I don't like to say, well, you should have gone to Indonesia if you think this is good because then what's that do to them? They're not, you know, they're really excited about where they're at in that moment. So my favorite buddy and dive right now was the last dive I did. Now it happened to be with Mike Young in cave exploration, <laughs> but 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 it just happened. But it may be even Gus next week. With that. Just, I'm just even saying. me. I'm kidding. I'm, me. I'm just joking. Do you, you know what I'm saying? I like I, to think I that way. I always say the next one. Yeah, the next, the next one. one. No, I I, next think, one. I think there's nothing like diving with somebody and showing them something for the first time. Yeah. That's always my favorite. Like when I took my brother to the ballroom at Ginny. It was his first time being on a spring with flow and whatever, and I can see how excited he is. So nothing really beats that, right? I mean, I love obviously diving with these guys. They're super competent. I trust my life to them. But when I take a brand new diver to show them something new, I mean, that excitement is, is really intense. Yeah. You guys want to see what a room looks like after a... No. There's no. Just, uh, <laughs> this is clean already, by the way. We've already, like, packed a... 
And our dive van right now, it's really an interesting smell. Okay, question, uh, smell is exactly, but it's a question here for you guys. How do you prevent task loading in situations where, the, where there are a large number of uncertainties? So it, it's not really task loading when 90% of your activity is already muscle memory, mm -hmm. you know? That's, that's where the practice part comes in. If you, if you practice your buoyancy and trim and, and your line skills and you know adding gas with your MAV, if you practice that to the point where it's muscle memory, then your brain doesn't even go there. It concentrates on the other things that are happening. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And you can lose it fast. I mean, you really have to do this stuff regularly. This question comes up a lot in our, in our live streams as well. Where is somewhere you want to go diving that you haven't been to yet? Right, let's go around the room, Mike. Trek Lagoon, but I'm going there in a month, so I'll check that <laughs> well, I'll have to find a new place I want to go. And it's amazing. You're going to have to love it. <laughs> Randall? Yeah, truck or bikini? Yeah, bikini Atoll. That'll be, that'll be awesome. Yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> I, there's a lot of places I want to go. Uh, one, of my, one of my places that I, I'm going to have to visit is uh, Budapest. The caves on oh, Budapest. Yes. I mean, that's one of the oldest, you know, cities in Europe, and, and it was built because of the caves. And so I don't want to dive those caves. Huh. This is an interesting question because yes. you can get multiple answers. Do you guys account for calories and food before a dive or just eat normally? <laughs> <laughs> you get really, really hungry doing this. It's not just the diving, there's a lot of gear schlepping, for lack of a better word. But I, mean, I guess gotta... the question is how do we prepare for it? Like, is there any special food that we eat or avoid maybe? Like, is there any food that you guys avoid before a dive? No. no. Don't eat anything you don't want to put into your rebreather. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's way more important to be hydrated before you dive. Yeah. And otherwise just eat normally rather than trying to worry about yeah, your, worry about your cat the calories you're gonna burn before you dive. Just go eat a big meal afterwards. Yeah. Which we which we've been doing. Yeah, which we do. Yeah. And it's really reasonable here in Cozumel and the food's excellent. This person is asking, why do you guys go all the way to Cozumel and not dive in the ocean? Because <laughs> the caves are better. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a virgin exactly. cave. Oh my goodness. And the ocean diving is great, but the caves are better. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, to be fair, this this uh, last few days, there's no ocean diving, right? Right, it's right. Close. No, the weather the weather oh. is preventing people from diving the ocean. Yeah. Um, somebody else asked if the temperature can vary tremendously as you go inside a cave, deeper in, into a cave. Yeah. So that that depends on the cave. Okay, um, if the cave is connected to uh, a, a body of water and there's no flow in it, mm -hmm. then it'll have thermal climbs e even with like the lake if it's connected to a lake. Okay, but if there's flow coming out, then the water temperature is going to be the same no matter what depth you're at. Now, as you go as you go between like the salt water and the fresh water, you can get a temperature variation there because the fresh water will usually be cooler than what the salt water will be. Yeah, here in these caves, yeah, in these yeah. particular ones. Yeah. In these caves, I've been feeling it really drop off in like the last 10 or 5 to well, 10 Well, all of this fresh rain, rain over the past few days is colder oh, that's than right. the okay. salt water. Okay. Yeah. And so... That makes sense. This is a, this is a weird question. Mike, have you ever been uh, bitten by one of the creatures of the alligator farm? Alligator farm? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell us a story? From, no, uh, I mean, we, we... When we all... We had the little alligators, we'd get bit every once in a while. I mean, it happens. Never, I never got bit by a big one. <laughs> and it was usually doing something stupid. You know, you shouldn't have been. I can't believe you guys let me actually jump on an alligator and somehow handle a gigantic alligator that looked like it could eat me. But I got to do that. So, uh, Another experience so there, Mike gave me. There have been several questions about the, the Blue Spring episode. You said you wanted to add some clarity as well. Like some people are asking questions about how do you feel to see a hole that says nobody can fit and you're like, hold my beer and you just wait. And like, you know, people are asking well, for one anything thing, that wasn't in there. For one thing, side mount was not readily available like it is now, okay? And matter of fact, there was the only side mount system that was on the market was the Armadillo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we contacted Kurt and, and of course he didn't know who we were or what we were doing and he was, he was like, well, I'll give you a discount, but you know, I, I'm not going to give you three harnesses, you know, 
And so, but even with the discount, it was too expensive for us to buy an armadillo. Mm -hmm. So, so we had to get creative and we had to make our own. And so two of the guys, they, uh, uh, they had read some about like West Skiles. They used to make them out of the old, uh, BCs, you know, the wraparound BCs. Yeah. And so they, that's what we, we made a, a little stainless steel butt plate for them to hook their tanks to and attached it on the BC. And, uh, and I bought a, uh, dive right trans pack that just come out. And, uh, it, and the wing was all bungee down, but it, even that is still, the wing would come up some. So I made a lead plate to go in the middle of it because we're diving dry suits and aluminum <laughs> tanks. So yeah. we had to wear like 24 pounds of lead anyway. Yeah. And so I made this big lead plate to go right in the middle of the back. And, uh, and of course it <clears throat> absorbed all the abuse, you know? But we had to invent it because, you know, it wasn't there. And, and also you told us that you know the whole, the whole thing about moving gravel out of the way. You guys had to do it at night, right? Yeah. Well, in in order to explore the Blue Spring anyway, we, we we approached the landowner, and she was she was very nice, and she said, "Well, we have another group who's wanting to do it also, and you know we're gonna, you know we'll 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 look at you guys and, and decide which group we'll let do it, and and." Uh, and so uh, they ended up picking us, and, and uh, then the lawyers that were involved for a little bit for the liability and stuff, you know. And, and so once we got all the okay and everything, um, I made a comment, you know, I was like, you know, it may increase your uh, tourism coming in because people may want to come and see us uh, dive, you know. Yeah. And she said, oh, no, 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 that won't work. <laughs> she said, you, you'll have to dive when we're closed because I'm not gonna charge admission. And when one of you dies, yeah. I will have made money off that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's like, so you can't, you can't dive any when, when it's open. <laughs> and uh, I was like, what do you mean when one of you dies? She goes, well, that's a given. Somebody's gonna die doing this. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, Thank she's like, this is just, <laughs> you not know. pleasant. Yeah, and so, and so we had to go after hours. After they closed each night, we would, we would go and dive and then, uh, during the winter, they close, uh, I think they were closed year round, or, or during the winter they were closed. Uh, yeah. And we were, when we were able to go in uh, anytime we wanted during, during the winter hours. But, That's uh, awesome. But during the spring, we had to wait until after like nine o'clock to go dive. And so then we would get out at like two in the morning and go back over to the dive shop and, and the dive shop owner let us put hammocks up in the attic, you know, and so we're up there. And so we sleep till about noon. And then, and, and, you and guys then. must have been paid millions to do this. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, uh, but, but we pro we we estimated that we moved like eighteen tons of gravel <sighs> in a three month period. Wow, unbelievable. Um, somebody asked a really good question here: Can they get certified with you as an instructor, like Sidewinder certified, Spirit, whatever? It's possible, yes. <laughs> they have to uh, catch you, but but you know, I'm 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 so busy with production right now mm -hmm. that I I really don't you know take take students on on a regular basis. Okay, the the only the only people I really take on are, are special circumstances. You know, like uh, like uh, Josh. You know, he did you know, he's right. paraplegic and and uh, and then I, I have some veterans that I work with there and locally and. Things like that, you know, uh, or you know, instructors who who need to get who need to get certified, but they don't have the opportunity or, or the ability to do it along the schedule. And I happen to be free; I can I can go into so it. Special right, but right next to Mike, I can highly, 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 highly recommend this guy. Well, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, now Randall is schedules it regularly. <laughs> To Randall do instructions. He absolutely knows this unit inside. Yep. And your Sidewinder and LTE. And yeah, you have to configure it. You've got your. He's, I don't know. I'm just telling you, you're being very good. Hands. But it, there are a lot of really good instructors out there. Getting trained by me yeah. is probably. And, 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 and to be honest, I don't teach on a regular basis. And so I always <laughs> worry about whether or not I do a good job at it. And so whenever I do take somebody on that I'm going to teach, I don't do a structured class. I do more of a mentorship, and it takes like three times longer because I don't want to miss something. 
Right. And so. It's awesome. I just feel like if, if, if anyone learns rebreathers with you, they would be rebreather certified and kiss technician certified <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get a twofer. Um, okay. That's the advantage if you do class with Mike, he'll take you into the factory, you'll build your unit, and then <laughs> yeah, then build a couple more. Yep. All right. Uh, let's see. People are wondering if you were discouraged having to remove all that gravel, like for months and months and months. Were you discouraged? Like at some point, were you like, you know what? Let's just go and hide somewhere else. Let's dump. No, because we didn't. We didn't have a lot of other places to go. Uh, and, th and this was open to us and it was cave diving you know even though we were moving gravel and, uh, and we at one point we hooked up a dredge so we could vacuum the gravel up nice people and, ask that question why did you choose a vacuum yeah we did we, we set up a dredge and we set up this big holding tank at 70 feet mm -hmm. and we would dredge off of the bottom up into the holding tank and then when it got full then I would go up and do my decompression at the holding tank while I vacuumed it out nice People are saying your it's hands are gigantic. What? You oh. have normal hands. It's just perspective. <laughs> Look at the screen. It's closer to the camera. <laughs> closer to the camera. Brad, no, don't show your hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah let's see the, the real hand. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Here you go, Mike. Compare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're too close. Okay. There you go. Yeah, well. uh, this is an interesting question. Will you ever revisit... Put muscles out. <laughs> <laughs> Will you ever revisit the pool in my... Santa Rosa, New Mexico? I mean, yeah, I guess. If if I if I was passing through and had an afternoon to kill, I would. But would you go in the cave? Uh, the we can't. It, it you have to remove the the, uh, the 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 big vent that's over the cave. Yeah, is hard to remove. It's yeah, not. the vent, the chain but, but, fence. But, and, yeah. but even if they offer to remove it, there's no reason to go in there, right? You no, I've seen what I need to see. And, uh, and, and, and the thing is, is you, you have to realize that, that there's a big, huge pile of rocks down there. And these rocks are not stable. And so when you go, when you go wiggling around through these rocks, you could collapse them down on your, you know. Yeah. That place will never be safe to be open to cave diving. And so if, you, if you're not going to be able to open it to the public, then there's not a lot of reason for trying. Well, just, just the entrance to that cave would be considered a major restriction by any cave diving standards. Oh, wow. yeah. It's, it's tiny. Actually, we had to work on that for yeah. yep. Are there four any, days. <laughs> are there any Mayan remains in Cozumel Caves? Yes. But we will not tell you where. Good. Yep. Is there any research on long-term issues or, I guess, effects with rebreathers? Lone exposure to scrubber agents, you know, things like that. Any studies that you're aware of? I don't know of any studies, but there should not be any. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not, there's not any toxins or anything in the scrubber. The scrubber just absorbs the CO2 and, and, and filters it. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be like breathing next to a HEPA filter. So, right. It's yeah. the same material they use in like medical devices. Um, Terry's asking, does anyone in the team have any projects they can financially support and if so, how? Excellent question. <laughs> Excellent question. We yes. have the opportunity, and I'm not sure when the project is, but Fernando has a biology, a biological survey he needs to do in a cenote over on the mainland. And he needs to get a piece of equipment that uh, very expensive. Is, is, is very expensive. And so we need to find a way to raise money for him so that he can, he can purchase this piece of equipment. And then we can be the divers to go and do this project for him. So we've been talking about it. You know, we may, um, we're going to try to set something up on, through Dive Talk because, you know, um, you guys are amazing and that would really, really benefit him a lot. We'll, we'll come yeah, up I mean, with he, something. He's, he's, he's doing scientific research on, on the highest level. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's amazing the stuff that he's involved in. And Mike said it will even donate some interesting things for donors to possibly yeah, I, win. Uh, 
I was thinking that if we could work out, you know, how, how to actually do it, because I don't want to really do a raffle, but yeah. I want to show appreciation for whoever, you know, does donate. But, uh, but I will give one of my six inch plus Meg teeth wow. to the project. I'm donating. I want it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's nice. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll come up with more details for that. Trying to find um, picture. Do you have procedures for when you're moving rocks and a collapse occurs? That's a pretty cool case. Let me, let me stabilize this. Hold on. Moving rocks is difficult, okay? And 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 I've and I've worked with with dry cavers moving rock, and so I've got a little bit of experience with it. And first, you have to look at it from an engineering point, and hopefully, you you have visibility that you can actually see the rocks and what's holding and what back you know uh, but like when we were in the Dominican and uh, we were trying to get those guys those guys were trapped because there was in my humble opinion uh, there was no way they went up that slope with the rocks in the position they were in okay because they had a back neck tank on and we only had like 14 inches of room for Ed and I to go through right so there was no way they went through so evidently they created a rock slide after they got up there mm, okay so the rocks were not stable in there. And so when you go to move a rock, you have to feel what's around it, what it's touching, and then you wiggle the rock and you see if the other rock wiggles. And then you see how much tension is on that rock. If there's a lot of tension on the rock, then you can't move it. And so there's a, there's unsafe in a cave. I've been buried. Yeah, I've been in rock sites that are buried. <laughs> so they're just, they're just casual, buried ones. <laughs> so uh, there's, there's that. Are there any, uh, there any spots remaining on the dive talk meetup in July? Yes, yes. but very, very little. Um, there's very, very little. So. Wow, thank you, by the way, to Land 13. You just gave yeah. a really nice super chat. And you said, Mike, you're such a, oh, it's fading. You're such an interesting man. Gus Woody, thanks for the content. Dive Talk trip is going to be great. Any useful mods for the, I think she's talking about the Spirit. Any useful yeah. mods, modifications? For the Spirit LTE. Well, we're, we're, we're continually making modifications, trying to be, my, my goal is to try to continue to make better units, right? Yeah. So depending on what model they have, there may be some modifications that can be done to make it a better unit. Well, one, one cool mod that I, I really enjoy is the stand. The stand for the Spirit. Mm -hmm. It yeah. really makes it uh, easier to don on a boat and stuff, so that's a good mod to have. The handle on top between the... The handle, yes. Between the shoulder hearts. They've been the shipping shoulders. the handles now, right? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. No, really I mean, dual, I don't know what you unit you have. I, I made one with a rigid handle one time, but it kind of hurt. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, uh, there's newer dual MAVs that they have. They, you know, you it just depends on what model they have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some updated counter lungs, stuff like that. For someone interested in going into tech and also rebreathers, which I, is part of tech, so I'm not sure, which would you recommend to do first? Oh. Well, you need to know the technical aspect of diving in order to dive a rebreather. So it's better if you get that foundation mm -hmm. first, then move to the rebreather. Yeah. Because the more you know and the more you have in muscle memory, the better off you are when you when you go to do something really difficult. Maybe so. even some basic books, like not not super techy, but well, I wrote some basic rebreather mm -hmm. book. What's it called? Oh, I'm forgetting the name of her books. Mel Clark we're talking about, and mm -hmm. she's got some really good, easy to read, um, like everything you wanted to know about, you know, technical CCR diving or something like that. So I'd recommend it. That's what I read when I first started. Um, I it really thinking, helped me. I always think from an instructor standpoint, it's a good idea for you to have a really solid open circuit foundation before you move into rebreather. Um, like the sidewinder, for example, you have to be an open circuit side mount diver before you can even take a class on a sidewinder. So, well, so another, another, another thing that I always, you know, when somebody comes up to me and starts talking about whether they want to dive a rebreather, I'm like, well, what type of diving do you do? If you're not diving types of dives that require a rebreather, then open circuit is, is a good way of diving. Yeah. And, and there's, there's not really a need to, to add the extra task loading and, uh, and risks of a rebreather if you don't need that, yep. you know? 
It's really easy to strap a tank on and go dive. It's, it's yeah, not really oh easy to God. strap on a rebreather and go dive. Dude, every it's time fun. I go on an open circuit dive, I feel like I'm forgetting something. It's because I throw five things in a bag and I'm like, I, that's it, I think, that's it? Am I forgetting something? Yeah. Uh, um, when are we going on a lionfish killing spree? That's a lionfish question. Soon, I, I want to. I mean, we gotta get that organized. <laughs> yeah. It's like, do a little time. At the meetup. At the meetup. Hopefully yes. at the meetup. Cozumel. And yes, there are spots left, but not many. Are there any age where you think it becomes unsafe to dive? No. There, there could be medical reasons why it would be unsafe to dive, but not age. Mm -hmm. As long as you're I mean, cl cleared by your doctor. Yeah. You know, that's the I mean, thing. it's good physical exercise. I mean, it's not, it's not harmful on your joints or anything like that. Diving would be one of the best things to do as an older person. Let's say you're running low on air for any situation or closer to the edge of the world. Like, what would you do if you're running low on air and you have deco? Well, first of all, you don't get yourself in that situation. Right. 100%. <laughs> uh, but no, yeah. Uh, no, I don't think I would. I don't know. That, that would there's just no good answer there. Yeah, if it, it, if it dives planned properly, there's very few circumstances where that would actually happen. It, yeah. It's like, better to be bent than run out of air. I don't you know if you're under. Yeah, but would you skip shallow stops yeah. or deep stops? You know, yeah. that's a tough yeah, question. That's, 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 that one's been discussed by everybody and everybody. Yeah, yeah. I, I think personally, I would go for the shallow stops. Yeah, yeah. I do too. I'd probably skip the deep ones, but yeah. And just yeah. Yeah. breathe a lot of O2. Mm. Um, are there any special certifications you need for cave exploration or is it all based on experience that's funny I was asking Randall that earlier today actually is, is so it... there's not really any certification for exploration um, the the best thing is to do like a mentorship find, find somebody that is actively exploring mm -hmm. and yep. try to uh yeah, there are friends with them, and there are some certifications out there for things like uh, cave survey and things like that that are that are on top of a full cave certification. But just true, go out and lay line in something new. There's there's not much. That would be a cool class. But the problem is, where do you do it too? Because you know, in classes you have the practicum, like you have to go and actually do whatever you're learning. Yeah. If you do cave exploring, like. I guess if you had enough money and you'd sponsor a team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be... Hint, hint. <laughs> um, somebody asked a really good question, which is, are there any companies working with a computer that will read CO2 levels? Because the new sidewind that the Liberty does. They're talking about yeah. adding okay. that, aren't they, Mike? So I'm going to put in my two cents here, okay? All right, here we go. You're entitled. Yeah. C CO2 sensors... Uh, for one thing, are, are in, in a 100% humidity environment, most of the CO2 sensors are in infrared and they don't read accurately in a humid environment. So, so the sensor companies are doing all these things to try to mitigate that, okay? But, the, but it's still a basic flaw, okay? But the human body is an excellent CO2 sensor in itself. When you start running, when you, when you take off and start running, pretty soon you start breathing more. Okay, it's not because your body is low on oxygen. It's because your blood is accumulating CO2. I mean, so your body will tell you when there's CO2. Okay, but the worst CO2 hit I had, we were working over in the Yucatan, and I had handled one of my mushroom valves with some chemicals on my hands and didn't realize it. And then it sat out for a few days and got warm in the vehicle. And then when I went to dive it, it fell apart. Okay. Ooh. So I was exhaling into the counter lung and then inhaling right back in, okay? So at about 60 feet deep, I started feeling the symptoms of the CO2 hit. And so I was like, okay, I need to abort this dive. Now, if I had had a sensor in the head with the oxygen sensors, it would have never told me because the, the gas wasn't going there. Yeah. It would have never said. And I could have looked at my computer and said, oh, my CO2 levels are fine. Zero. I'm okay. This is awesome. Yeah. And I, and I would have kept going, right? So bad information is worse than no information when it comes to CO2. Okay? Now, if you were to put a CO2 sensor in a unit that you wanted it to be 100% reliable, it's going to need to be in the mouthpiece. It's going to need to be the gas you're actually breathing. 
Okay? But that's my opinion. Now, there's going to be a lot throat, of... Just in your throat. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people say, you know, it's better to have some kind of reading than no reading. But in CO2, that's not the case. You know, oxygen it is because you cannot physically tell if your oxygen levels are elevated or not. But CO2, you can. You can actually feel it. So, Interesting. Great explanation. That's cool. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to combine two questions. The first one was, are you going to Poland to oversee the building of the rebreathers that now is being done in Poland? And second, are you working on any other game changers for diving that are not rebreathers? So, um, the, the CE version of the Sidewinder was de designed and developed primarily by the engineers in Poland and Patrick. Um, uh, they understand what is needed for the CE and all of that uh, better than I do. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, I'm still really busy with production side of it. Um, but once they get production moved and, and they're doing uh, all of that stuff, I'm going to start focusing more on developing new product. We got some cool stuff. I want it. <laughs> he had me at I'm going to develop. I want one. <laughs> I want one. Whatever it is. I'm in. All right. So let's try to answer like three more questions. So if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and shoot them now because we're going to answer like three more and then we're going to uh, yeah. call it for the night. <laughs> Sleep. Yeah. You guys have fun with more diving tomorrow. So let's see. Um, Mike, have you seen any damage to the caves or cenotes due to construction of the Tren Maya, which is the, the train that they're making? I have not dove in any of those caves over there. Right. Uh, so, so no, I've not seen any damage or from right. the construction. But there is a lot of construction here in Cozumel too, right? Going on. Yeah, and, and, and the cenotes are federally protected, and so they're, they're not supposed to damage them. And, like, we know of one cenote where they actually had to build a bridge across it uh, to, mm. to protect it, you know, um, to keep traffic off of it. Nice. So, so they, they do. It's, it's not like the government is not concerned about the cenotes and they're going to just build this train and tear everything up. They are concerned, you know, and they're doing the best they can. Uh, as a matter of fact, Herman was working with with the government over there uh, before he took this uh, job with the environmental protection, and and he was working on how to protect the caves and still build the train. Mm -hmm. So, well, and that's part of the reason why you know the the exploration that we're doing now and these maps that we're making are so important because it gives these these agencies an idea of where the system actually runs, um, so that they know if any construction projects are going to affect it. Yep. Are you going to continue to keep exploring the cave you were just at? So the cave we're diving this weekend, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this this is going to be an ongoing project. <clears throat> Ideally, we'll we'll be making uh, trips down on a routine schedule so that they can start a database and collect data. Uh, you know, for you know environmental situations. You know, like on a certain period once a year, and they can see if if there's any trending issues. Just saying, like um, we're available. Yeah, <laughs> like we're we're in, we're in. We're okay, last question. This is for <laughs> everyone. What is your favorite cave that you've dived in? Dived in so far. What is your favorite? Uh, a lot of them. I know. <laughs> I like a lot of them. Do you yeah. have your favorite number one? For me, I've said many times the glass factory. Yeah, I mean that, that's yeah. an incredible cave. Yeah. But. When when I'm when I'm over there, uh, it's everything is so fragile. Is you you're like you're just afraid just to move, terrible. you know. <laughs> you know and, and then Brian's like, hey, since your skills are so good, I'm gonna take you to this place, you know, since in, in the nobody ever, you know. And I'm, uh, sorry guys, the, 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 the we we got some spotty Wi-Fi, but he was saying Little River. I also it is my favorite Florida cave. I I don't know if they heard that or Little, not, but Little River's is awesome. That's it's song. Fred Flintstone like world. <laughs> there, I feel like it's something about it. Funny you said that. Dance cave is cool. Um, yeah. The, this is the the last question. I promise. Is has any one of you been asked to provide feedback in movies, like diving movies, consulting, or anything like that? Well, yeah, I was. I did uh, 
the logistics for Ancient Cave, and then I was their only safety diver <laughs> in Ancient Cave. How about so. that? I've never been asked feedback for movies, but we've been called uh, about uh, court, pending court cases that they've asked our opinion on, and we usually decline a lot of those because I know a lot of the people involved usually. So. That's cool. Yeah. We were asked for feedback on the Netflix show about the Thai cave rescue for the silt-out oh, right. scenes. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make it as realistic as possible without going zero vis because then you can't see anything. Um, so we were we were involved with that, and that was that was pretty fun. You could have given them some of our footage from today. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, the Ron Howard movie they yeah. they used one of my miles. sidewinders. That's right. So yeah. Anything else? Any wrap up? And and Woody got to die of that exact sidewinder in Roaring River. How about that? That was awesome. All right, guys. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to today's Go Live. Um, we appreciate all of you. We appreciate all the questions. Great project here at Cozumel. We're actually leaving tomorrow, but the guys stay here to keep diving. There's actually more people coming, so the team will get replenished yeah. uh, in a way. And uh, we can't wait to be back and uh, obviously to dive with Mike and Randall and Mike Henry as well. Uh, so thank you guys and uh, yeah, say goodbye. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. Show say goodbye, up. everybody. There they are. See you. Take care. <laughs>